Welcome back, biology and health students. We're going to continue our conversation about STIs and STDs today. There's a lot of talk about the coronavirus in the news today. We're going to talk about some viruses. We're going to talk about some different viruses. So we got herpes. You may have heard of that one, simplex 1 and simplex 2. The cold sores on your mouth are simplex 1. HPV, which stands for human papillomavirus, hepatitis B, and HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. So one of the good things about viral infections is that they are preventable. You can get a vaccine for HPV. You can get a vaccine for hepatitis. Um, they, the symptoms are treatable. So if you do happen to contract herpes, you can um, get a cream, for example, to alleviate the symptoms. The bad thing about viruses is that they are not curable. So you can't take an antibiotic and get rid of a viral infection the way you can get rid of a bacterial infection. So the first virus we're going to talk about is the human papillomavirus, HPV. It is the most common sexually transmitted infection that we have. Approximately 79-80% of Americans are currently infected, and CDC estimates that everyone who is sexually active, if they don't get the vaccine, will have HPV at some point in their life. So the majority of cases are the teens um, and the early 20s. So again, that's the age range that I work with. So that's the group that I'm mostly concerned with. Um, and there's 14 million new infections each year. And we're really getting a good idea of how um, disease is spread. With corona being in the news, we are understanding a lot about the contact. And one person can affect multiple people and then those multiple people affect multiple people and how quickly this spreads. So you can apply that same idea to sexually transmitted infections and that if you pass it to one person and you are not yet monogamous for the rest of your life, that one person is going to pass it on to all the people that they have. And you can look at it another way. The person you're with is carrying any of the viruses that that person may have contacted uh, during their prior experiences. There's actually 40 different strains of HPV. There are two that cause genital warts and there are two that cause cervical cancer. So those are the four that concern us the most. And back in 2004, um, vaccines were being produced and now administered to uh, girls. And then I think 2006, uh, another vaccine was produced that's administered to boys. So this vaccine targets those four strains that cause us problems. So um, again, those raised fleshy colored growths you can see in these pictures, some are very obvious, some are less obvious. And depending on where your contact originated, um, the HPV can cause cervical, anal, penile, and oral pharynx, so again, the mouth, throat area, cancers. Herpes is our next most common viral infection. One in six people in America have herpes. That's 55 million people in the United States that have reported that they have genital herpes. More than 85% of the population is estimated to have it and not know they have it. So it's a very common asymptomatic virus, so if you're not tested, you wouldn't know that you have it. So you want to be uh, regularly tested if you're a sexually active individual. Um, 48 million people are unaware that they currently have this infection. All right, we've talked about cankers, fleshy growths, now let's talk about blisters. Blisters are associated with the herpes virus. There are two strains of herpes, the herpes simplex 1, normally in the oral area, and herpes simplex 2, normally in the genitalia. You can contract herpes 2 in the oral area and herpes 1 in the genital area through oral sex. So this virus is transmitted through sexual activity. You don't have to exchange fluids. Also um, through kissing. There are antiviral medications that can keep the virus um, at bay, so it kind of puts it in a latent period. Um, and also over-the-counter creams that can alleviate the symptoms of the virus. So the blisters may appear on the genitals, the rectum, or the mouth. Itching or burning sensation is usually associated with an outbreak of the, the blisters and also painful urination. 
So the next symptoms are pretty common with any type of infection. It's your way, your body's way of fighting infection. So you get swollen glands. We have white blood cells hanging out in our lymph nodes, and those white blood cells are trying to cleanse our um, lymph of all of the bacteria and any other organisms that shouldn't be in our body. So we often get swollen glands with any infection as well as fatigue because our body's working overtime, trying to fight an infection. Um, we get achy muscles and fever. Our body's way of trying to help organisms from reproducing inside of us is to set our temperature at a higher temperature. That's why we get fevers. So that um, causes your, like, your liver to hold on to zinc, which bacteria need in order to reproduce. Um, it also allows for a faster metabolism in your own body cells, so you're reproducing your own cells, repairing tissue more quickly. So that's the purpose of a fever. Hepatitis B is the form of hepatitis that is transferred through sexual activity. There are five strains of hepatitis, A, B, C, D, and E. E was a new one for me. I just discovered that when I was researching for this PowerPoint. There are vaccines for hepatitis A and hepatitis B, so they are preventable. Hepa refers to the liver, the root hep refers to the liver. So again, itis is inflammation of whatever came first. So hepatitis is technically the inflammation of the liver, and that may or may not be due to sex. But if you have hepatitis B, that is due to sex. So the most common risk factors for contracting hepatitis B are injection drug use, so it's transmitted through the bloodstream, multiple sex partners, the more partners you have, you're widening that contact scope, right? And men who have sex with men. So we can see uh, the numbers in this graph. The numbers have dropped quite a bit since 2002. That would be because um, in 1990, the hepatitis B vaccine was recommended for children on a regular basis. So here you can see on the right quadrant of your body, the liver, and this is where the um, hep hepatitis B vaccines will congregate. So they cause problems in the liver if you don't get the HBV vaccine. The symptoms are flu-like, so at first you might not know that you have HBV if you're not tested. You may just think you have the common flu. Pain in the upper right abdomen is starting to give you an idea that this might be settling in your liver. Jaundice is a key symptom. So the yellowing of the skin and eyes, and then aches and pains and fatigue and swollen glands, we said are common. Dark urine is another key example. Like it could be as dark as coffee. A key characteristic of HBV is this yellowing of the skin and eyes. And that's due to the buildup of bilirubin. Bilirubin is a byproduct of red blood cell breakdown, which happens in the liver. AIDS, is it an STI or an STD? It is an STD. It is the disease. It is showing signs and symptoms. HIV is the STI. It is the infection of the virus, the presence of the virus, but it is not yet showing signs and symptoms. So it's chronic, meaning that it's reoccurring or continuing, potentially life-threatening condition. It damages your immune system, specifically your helper T cells, which are supposed to alarm the rest of your um, immune system of an in infection. It in so it interferes with our body's ability to fight infections and diseases. One of the big things we want people to know is how HIV can and cannot be transmitted. So it can be transmitted through sexual contact or sharing needles. So it's in the bodily fluids. It can also be transmitted from mother to fetus through the bloodstream. It can also be transmitted from mother to baby through the mother's milk. Although there are medications that um, can alleviate that possibility. It cannot be transmitted from casual contact, not from hugging, kissing, talking, sharing a drink, using the same toilet, the same telephone. It can't be 
spread through casual contact. The human immunodeficiency virus first broke onto the scene in the early 80s. A group of gay men in San Francisco and New York City were dying of bizarre diseases with an unknown cause. Since then, we have discovered a great deal of information and we understand this disease much more. So there is treatment now. There was not treatment um, back in the day. So antiretroviral therapy is used. Usually it's a cocktail of drugs because the virus is constantly changing. Um, and the best chance for survival is early detection. So tomorrow I'm going to talk about AIDS in more detail and we'll talk about the different stages of its progression. And if you are able to start treatment ASAP, you're able to keep your viral load undetectable. So another reason why we push, 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 get tested. So symptoms are night sweat and weight loss. And, and that, like we all have weight loss if we're dieting or whatever, but if you don't have a reason for your weight loss, you haven't cut back on your food, you haven't sped up the amount of energy you're expending, um, then you would want to know why you're losing weight, right? So over here, this is characteristic of the AIDS wasting syndrome. Um, swollen glands, we talked about that. Fatigue, those are common with everything, right? So flu-like symptoms, at first you don't know if you have the flu, if you have a persistent cough and you're night sweating. So if all of these things are kind of happening together, you want to get tested, which there's even at-home testing now. Some common um, symptoms that you might get with HIV is thrush, which is like an oral yeast infection, so it'll cover your tongue with... Um, a white coat, I guess, and then opportunistic infections. So once you start getting these opportunistic infections, you've progressed from the STI of HIV to the STD of AIDS. This graphic is comparing the numbers from 2010 to 2017. So in 2017, 1.8 million people were newly infected with HIV. It's a decrease over the last seven years of 18%. So that's a good sign. Yay, education, we're spreading the news, but also yay you for getting tested and treated early. Again, if we can keep the viral load undetectable, we can eliminate our chance of passing on this deadly infection. So wrapping up our two-day discussion, the number of STIs have been increasing for the past five years. We have reached an all-time high in American history. Um, the number of young people ages 15 to 24, which is my group of people, acquire half of the new STDs. In fact, one in four females that are in that adolescent range, range is likely to have an STD, like chlamydia or human papillomavirus, which may be asymptomatic, so they don't know that they have it unless they get tested. And then if they're sexually active, they're passing it on to somebody else. Adolescents 15 to 19 are more likely to get an infection. They have a higher risk of STD for a combination of reasons. One, it's behavioral. We think that we are invincible. And we see that down at the beaches right now with spring break and the coronavirus where we're being told to not gather and the younger people think that they're not going to get it. They'll be okay. They'd rather enjoy the beach. Biological, our tissues are thinner, if you will, and are more likely um, or lend themselves to be more susceptible to penetration of a bacteria or a virus. Also cultural reasons. It's taboo to have sex when you're young. So they're not talking to their parents. They're not talking to each other about previous experiences. They're not going to the drugstore to get condoms. They're not going to a doctor's office to get a test because they just don't want anybody to know what they're up to. So that has to do with the behavioral and the cultural aspects as well. But what it happens is it leads us more likely to get an STD. So remember April 12th to the 18th is STD Awareness Week. So take what you learned and share it. Thanks for listening.